is Professor Negar Motahede. Professor Motahede is an Associate Professor of Literature and Women's Studies at Duke University. She's a cultural critic and film theorist, specializing in interdisciplinary and feminist contributions to the fields of Middle Eastern studies and film studies. She has published um, over 40 peer-reviewed journal articles and book chapters. I have no idea how. Um, and she has uh, authored three books, edited um, another book, um, and I know that she has another uh, book project in the works right now. Um, her books include Representing the Unpresentable Images of Reform from the Qajar to the Islamic Republic of Iran, which was published in 2007, Displaced Allegories Post-Revolutionary Iranian Cinema, which was published in 2008, Hashtag Iran Election, Hashtag Solidarity, and The Transformation of Online Life, which was published in 2015, and she's the editor of uh, Abu Baha's Journey West, The Course of Human Solidarity, which was published in 2013. She has received several academic honors, awards, recognitions, including the Persian Heritage Foundation Book Award for her 2008 book, and the Washington Post Middle East Book Award for her 2015 book. The title of Professor Motahedeh's lecture today is The Quest for Oil and the Construction of, our, of an Imaginary Modernity in Iranian Cinema. Please help me welcome Professor Nidal My aim is to drop the needle precisely on the recording of sound and voice in film. In the 1950s, it was the oil films of Ibrahim Gulistan and his independent film workshop that were the first to record sound outside of the studio system and on location in Iran. This may strike most of us as a minor fact perhaps a fact that is generally overlooked in the larger history of cinema. Yet when we turn to the long history of film, it is this local quotidian voice filmed on location that is Amimu's inarticulate greetings cry to a distant sea vessel and the record of his breathless elegiac sprint to save a block of ice against the backdrop of roaring oil fires in Amin Aderiz, the runner, that mark the presence of, the vi of a vital film industry after the Iranian Revolution. The cries of that impassioned and mysterious horseback rider, Gabbay's lover, in Mohsen Mahmadov's feature film bearing her name, Gabbay, or the Arabic inflection in the voice of the young boy, Boshu, from the oil-rich regions of the south, uh, of the war-torn south, um, <coughs> and 
the oil-rich regions of the war-torn south, Nayi's Dilaki dialect from the verdant northern regions of Iran, the mimic sounds of animals and the language lessons they exchange in Bahram Bezai's Bashu, the despair of the Kerman Shahi workers in the minivan scene and of Tuba and Gilane in Rakhshan Bani Etemad, culminating in her 2014 film, Bessaha, Tales. These films, these voices were the hallmarks of our encounter with Iranian cinema in, international, in the International Film Festival circuit in the era after the revolution. These voices captured our imagination as the exemplary specimens of Iranian cinema alongside the, dis, um, the disorienting ebb and flow of Mohsen Mahmarov's uh, voice in the final scene of Abbas Kiarostami's close-up, Namayi Nazdik, and the off-screen urban voices of the film crew who accompany Besa to the village of Siadare to document the death of a 100-year-old woman, one of 11 main characters we never see, but whose voices we hear in the wind will carry us. I'm a little bit um, windows challenged, so bear with me. Era, but my primary aim today is to show the ways in which the industrial and political processes of oil extraction in Iran are inscribed onto the enunciation of the films produced by the, uh, the Golestan workshop, such that the imprints of these processes come to mark the entire landscape of Iranian modernity in cinematic and digital history for decades after the revolution. The purchase of the first Gaumon camera by the monarch Mozaffar Ali Shah in Belgium in 1900 coincided with an oil concession granting the British millionaire William Darcy exclusive rights to Iranian oil for the next 60 years. The Anglo-Iranian Oil Company, by far the largest industrial employer in Iran, was built on this concession, the largest oil refinery in the world was assembled in the southern city of, of Abadan by means of it, a refinery that sustained two modern wars keenly designed by Winston Churchill, whose burden on the life and labor of the Iranian citizenry catapulted the nation onto the world stage in revolt. Looking back, it is undeniable that the looming question of the 1950s and 60s in Iran were those of labor, of oil nationalization, of struggles against the Anglo-Iranian oil company, and importantly, the CIA engineered coup d'etat in 1953, a coup that attempted to put an end to all of them. The film industry that emerged in the context of the upheavals of this era was not only catalyzed by the aesthetics of oil slicks and fires, of land excavation, and damage of rural habitats and their coevalness with a thriving urban modernity, but was also with ine inevitable subtlety conscious of an impending sea change. A 
and attuned to social struggles, political uprisings, and nationalist revolts arising from the existential dilemmas, um, existential dilemmas that accompanied the pillage of Iran for crude oil. The voice that resounded in the films produced by this industry at the moment of its emergence was thus a voice of struggle and of disillusion, of people's protest and of their lament. In Blames and Flames, Mohammad Reza Farzad tallies the films that were still on the screens in the course of the Iranian Revolution in the summer of 1978. Looking back through the devastation of the fire that burned down Cinema Rex in Tehran that, that same summer, it is undeniable that the film industry had been predicting the revolution for over a decade. Cityscapes that close this clip, bustling as they are with petroleum guzzling automobiles, were constitutive of the modern imaginary of an urban life sustained by oil. Foreign oil companies such as the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company, which we now know as BP, propagated precisely these modern landscapes as their own imaginary contribution to Iranian modernity in their documentaries claiming that it was their quest for oil in Iran that had brought along with it all the amenities of modern life, of, of a modern city. As one 20-minute documentary entitled A Persian Story Boasts, without oil, the world as we know it could not exist. Monadam Muji insists that 
this fit within the broader company message to the general public at home that oil extraction was fundamental to the process of modernity in Iran. This progress is not only enumerated in the voiceover, it is Im uh, embedded in the ways that the oil city is produced in the enunciation, both cinematically and aesthetically, as the location in which modernity is made possible for the Iranian people. In rapid cuts, dollies, dissolves, deserts are reclaimed, crops are improved, agriculture is mechanized, pipelines are laid down, oil is pumped and refined, so that in the modern city of Abadan, Iranian women can enjoy a leisured life of modern women everywhere, wearing two-piece swimming suits as they lounge poolside. Hospitals provide care for the sick, and uh, Iranian children receive schooling, Buses and motor vehicles stop and go to the rhythm of an industrious city. Indeed, by means of these enunciated cuts and dissolves, a veritable language of temporal progress in film, modern Iran, as a cinematic landscape, is built in a day. Towering behind this renaissance are the shining and fantastic shapes of oil wells pumping liquid power to Abadan. Without this imaginary construction, inscription, and circulation of cinematic spaces and rhetorical tropes, such as a beggar's cloak or the purse of gold, filmic Iran would not be. The Iranian film industry was grounded in this logic, a logic that I want to underscore was both territorial and terrestrial, even as it was in turn critical of it. While oil companies such as BP fixed and monumentalized their gains in territorial terms, the Iranian oil films of the 1950s and 60s set in flux and unmoored the permanence of these films by a logic that one can only describe as aquatic and watery. Born in the context of oil, the genealogy of voice in Iran, of the voice in Iranian cinema must be traced back to these precise uh, battles for natural resources, territory, and citizenry, traced, in other words, to a dynamic of power and politics 
that is systematically obscured by an overwhelming focus on the question of industry censorship. What my study of Golestan's films of the 1950s and 60s shows is that these films make of their aesthetics a vehicle whose singular elements are obviously enunciated by the dynamics of imperial expansion. They are transformed by them and awash in the ebb and flow of their currents. The dregs of these dynamics are precisely what mesmerized critics, perhaps unconsciously, when they spoke in the 1990s of the radical novelty of Iranian cinema in, in Iranian film festivals. And in this, they echoed President Jimmy Carter's characterization in the wake of the 1979 hostage crisis that Iranian grievances against the United States for backing an installed monarchy and for engineering a 1953 coup was ancient history. The recognition of the presumed radical novelty of post-revolutionary Iranian cinema and critics' reviews, in other words, casts as archaic and silent the films that made their round um, of international circuits in an earlier era, as ancient history, in other words. That Iranian cinema can be characterized as national is precisely because of the isolationist laws that were instituted to regulate the film industry um, and its screening practices in the early 1980s after the revolution, just as the nationalization of the oil industry was aimed to reconfigure Iran's geological and cultural boundaries in the 1950s. In the cinema of the post-revolution period, the decrees that governed the look of the camera led to the alteration of the narrative's spatial configurations, shifting the priority of the voice. Both Hamid Nafisi and I have discussed these regulations and their effect on the Iranian film industry in detail. But to consider how the qualities of oil extraction and the magical mutability of seawater that once shaped the enunciation of Golestan's oil films continue without fault to form the foundation of the political aesthetics of post-revolution films and the, and the digital practices of the later era, we need to take a look, a closer look at some of the workshops filmed. Ibrahim Golestan's film workshop was built on income from films commissioned by the newly nationalized oil consortium following Prime Minister um, Mossadegh's efforts to curtail British interests in Iran in 1951. According to Hamid Nafisi, the Golestan Film Workshop was to create by means of documentary films a modern imagined nation of Iran for dissemination both for Iranians and for the world. The cons this construction was energized by the thesis of syncretic westernization, which strove to represent Iran as a modern industrializing nation and an ancient culture with distinguished history and meaningful arts. The workshop was largely made up of intellectuals and writers whose creativity and engagement gave birth to a style that Nafisi calls poetic realism. One of the award-winning documentaries made between 1958 and 1961 by the Golestan workshop is titled A Fire, Yek Artash. It is about one of the world's largest oil well fires in the southern city of Ahbaz. A fire documents the 70-day process involved in extinguishing uh, fire with, as Nafisi recounts, footage of Iranian farmers working in their fields, the intercutting of industrial machinery and development with, on the one hand, the lighter side of laborers' work and their leisure activities, meals and times of rest, and on the other, with the life of rural folk affected by the encroaching industrialization.
village had to be moved away. If the flames were put out, the place would be smothered in gas from the wild wells. I want to just go to the beginning of the film and um, show the ways in which uh, both the text, the image, the sound, the voiceover, all of these elements of the film, all the enunciated elements of the film, um, act independently, almost as, uh, as musical notes or singular poetic elements that both describe and derive from the processes of oil extraction. So we start with a continuous, what you'll hear is a continuous sound of machinery. Then you will see uh, a text which says danger, um, drilling. Uh, and you hear a voiceover, it says suddenly a spark flew. Um, you hear the sound of raging fire. And then you see image of sheep running towards uh, their flock and children running towards their village. All these, all of these elements, so the image, sound, voiceover, um, and still image at the very beginning, are in some way derived from the processes of oil, and oil extraction. The film essentially is, is um, comes out of, is created out of, out of the processes uh, that uh, go into the drilling for oil. So, let's see if I can get this right. inscribes itself onto the text, the sound, the image, the voiceover, and then opens to the imaginary modernity of the film's landscapes. These, that is, both the modernity inhabited by industrialization and the archaic rural landscapes, um, which the film's technology casts as its own past, are the imaginary landscapes that will fill Iran's post-revolutionary screens for years to come from the opening sequence of Boshu's The Little Stranger in the Sun Ridge South to the village, village spaces of Kiarostami's Life and Nothing More. The archaic, or the rural, we should note, that is the sheep, the village children, the rural topology itself, remains silent and residual in the fire, framed quietly within the visual. As residue, the archaic is spoken, spoken for, let's say, by the industrial modernity of cinematic technology. In other words, by the film's studio recorded voiceover. One could say to push this even further, that to showcase its technology's own modernity, the film's voiceover speaks the silent archaic as its enabling past in another's tongue and in a voice inscribed onto it at a recording studio at a secure distance away. While an active and effective element of the present, the silent archaic registers a residual character of innocence which is only attributed to it in retrospect by the studio recorded British voiceover. When the silent archaic appears again in the workshop's 1963 film, The Hills of Morlik, Tapahoye Morlik, it does so to defy a number of boundaries as it does with more subtlety in the fire. The boundaries between documentary and fiction, between science and poetry, and, and indeed, it puts in flux the limits that bound life and death. The